This is the fun video. It's also the vague one. World building can involve designing anything from a cinematic multiverse to a single office in Pennsylvania, so I'm going to stick to the general principles that apply to all of it. Now, I've heard people talk endlessly about world building, and I swear each person says something completely different. I've chalked it up to them explaining how they build their own worlds, so I want to talk about it from a clean slate. I will tell you about how world building works and the types of things you need to do, but what those things look like will be up to your choice of design. If that sounds good, let's start. First, let's establish what the world and world building is. It's not a planet. A fictional world is the collection of settings a story is bound to follow. Yes, that also includes stories that, quote, take place in the real world. At the end of the day, no matter how realistic you intend your fiction to be, it is still fiction, and the world in your story is not truly the real one. It has been altered by your own biases and beliefs, as well as the characters you've made for it, and you will need to develop your world accordingly. The world is your anchor for your consistency and the backdrop your characters are scrutinized against. Any reader or audience can only assess your story in its entirety from the foundation set by your world. In other words, build it carefully. Violate your own world and you will immediately lose reader interest. If the protagonist wins because the rules change for them to do so, then you've lost the faith of the audience. Now that we know what the world is, let's start building them. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that if you're watching this, you already have an idea of a world in your head, and probably also have a bunch of random details you've already decided for it. As you'd expect, I'm going to ask that you pause and contemplate it for a bit. Do you want your world to be as strong as possible? I sure hope so. I will try my best to get you pointed in the right direction, so work with me on this. Ask yourself what aesthetic genre your story is supposed to be. Is it realism, magic realism, low fantasy, high fantasy, tech fantasy, science fiction, space opera, historical fiction, absurdism, and so on? Believe me, only a true immature thinks their story can't be classified by genre. So if you want to grow as a writer, then the only way forward is to swallow that pill and move on. Once you know the genre and aesthetic you want your story to follow, the next thing you need to do is research what the genre expectations are for it. These can be hard to distinguish from tropes and cliches, so I'm going to separate them out for you. Tropes are story beats that mechanically work so efficiently that you'll find them everywhere. For example, romantic stories where the couple begin by loathing each other but earn a mutual respect to the point where they are a couple at the end. That's a trope. Sure, it's been done a lot, but in the hands of a good writer, it can still be successful because the character, setting, and plot can still make for an engaging story. A cliché is an overused story beat that cannot be redeemed by anything else. It can be anything from some plot lines to characters and even entire worlds, but it can also be the words used to describe certain things or plot devices that are transparent garbage. The timer of the bomb being stopped at one second remaining, the romantic walk in a park at night, using a phrase like, the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. The professional being outdone by someone with no plausible experience. Anything that serves the exact same purpose every time it comes up and has no semblance of original thought. It comes up and your reaction is, oh, I know what happens next. And then it does. Genre expectations are the specific things fans of a certain genre, well, expect of stories made within it. Science fiction is going to have futuristic or otherwise advanced technology or knowledge. High fantasy has a magic system, legends, myths, heroes, monsters. Realism has occurrences plausible in reality. They are like tropes or cliches in that you've seen them before, but crucially, genre expectations are what make the story whatever genre it is. If a story is marketed as high fantasy, fans of high fantasy are going to be disappointed if it's about Barbara, the advertising executive in Manhattan. In the same way, a story marketed as realism is going to disappoint fans of realism if the climax is the protagonist fighting a dragon with an ancient magic sword. Research what genre expectations your story will have to either fulfill or at least address. Then, to prevent yourself from accidentally doing a cliché, learn what you can do in a new way. Next, let's discuss the purposes of a fictional world. Broadly speaking, your world has two jobs it needs to fulfill. The first is to facilitate the characters in the plot. The second is to fill in the background of the entire story. Let's start with the first job. 
If your story is a space opera murder mystery, you will need to design a world that has a space travel system, motives that could plausibly lead someone to kill, and an agency or agent that can do the investigating. If your story is an old western organized crime drama, you will need to design a world that has a crime organization which could plausibly operate in the Wild West. The world facilitates the characters and plot by providing justifiable evidence that the story works. In other words, it proposes a set of rules that make room for your character's existence and gives them the means to go through with the plot. The second job, filling in the background of the entire story, is closely related but still different. The world provides the factions, settlements, institutions, and so on that shape the ideologies and opinions of the characters. It contextualizes who the protagonist is, who the antagonist is, and why they are opposed. It explains why the protagonist has to do things in a certain way, and more importantly, why they can't do other things in other certain ways. Remember when Star Wars The Last Jedi first came out and everyone who was really into Star Wars canon was upset by the lightspeed crash scene? The reason is because of this second job of the world. See, the canonical world rules of Star Wars had to account for a logical question that often came up. Why would the antagonist build something like the Death Star when it would be much cheaper and easier to make a lightspeed object crash into things? Well, the world accounted for that by making such collisions impossible because the technology that allows them to go that fast is unable to interact with objects that aren't flying like that in the normal ways. This crash scene breaks that rule. And like I said in the intro, this makes the audience lose investment in the story because it can't hold itself accountable, and also lose faith in the abilities of anyone who can't come up with creative solutions within their world's own rules. If you're one of the people who claim canon doesn't matter, this is the core reason why it does. Alright, you know what a fictional world is and what it has to do, so let's talk about designing one. As per usual, I can't tell you what to do, but I want you to know what things to keep in mind to shape your world in the way that helps you the most. As I said earlier, knowing your particular genre expectations should be your first step. Which are helpful to you, which aren't helpful to you. Just figuring that out is a strong start. Next, you need to decide on the basic, fundamental rules your world is going to follow. These rules will be as immutable as the laws of physics. Sure, in early drafts you can make adjustments to them, but those adjustments must apply to the entire story. The rules cannot change during the story. If that creates an issue, then it's always the writer's responsibility to implement a creative way to resolve the issue without changing the rules to let the protagonist slip by. What do these rules look like? Well, let's say you have a magic system. In your system, everyone who has magic has bright blue eyes. There is an intrinsic property of magic that always, without fail, gives magic users bright blue eyes. You have tons of lore about it. The eyes are how magic users prove themselves. All of that. And then randomly, there's just some magic user with purple eyes. That might seem trivial, but it really isn't. When you write a story and someone is reading it, it's best to think of it as an investment. They give you time and trust you to know where to lead their imagination in a way they'll like. You keep them invested by posing them conflicts they want to see solved and questions they want to see answered. As you go, you solve some conflicts and answer some questions, but you keep proposing new ones as you go. Your credibility in this relationship is rooted in how well you do convincing them that you're not wasting their time, that every detail you say matters. So, sure, it may just be an eye color, but you convince them of that rule, and it's important enough to remember and think about. That purple-eyed magic user might seem cool to you, and you might think your readers won't care, but you'd be mistaken. Violating an established rule is a knock on your credibility to make good on their investment. They'll take a step back from the story because they can't trust you in the very world you designed anymore. Once you have your rules organized enough, you can begin the part I think is the most fun. Cultural design. Big world, small world, you're going to be designing a culture. Is it how different nations operate? Is it how a school club of three people operate? Same thing. Remember, world size in fiction is ultimately an illusion. It can be canon that there are a million people that are part of the same group. But realistically, you might have one named character who's a member. That's why designing a really complicated world doesn't actually have to take very long. 
Some people choose to spend countless hours world building because they enjoy it. That's perfectly fine, I enjoy it too, but don't think it's strictly necessary. As long as your world can perform its jobs and the story works, you're in business. Anyway, as I was saying, design the different cultures, identities, and other characteristics that inhabit the world. Something that will make your world far more interesting that's really easy to do, yet somehow often screwed up by even the professionals, is remembering that nations, ideologies, and other cultural groups are ultimately made up of people. Characters. If you've seen part one of this series, please do if you haven't, you probably know where I'm going with this. Groups of people are going to have very similar features as individuals. You know, contradictions, flaws, unique traits, and reasons for being in the plot. Like, let's say we're making a nation with a hyper-militaristic culture. What if their X but Y contradiction is that they really want to be the strongest fighting force ever, but they can't fight because their delusions of their own ability far outweigh their actual training and resources? An additional trait is that they all have fancy accents and wear decorative uniforms all the time. They integrate into the plot because they started a fight with an actually strong nation, and it's in that war your protagonist has to do the plot. The character sheet I used in part one literally works for groups of people too. Of course, when designing flaws for entities that could theoretically be the size of your fictional world, I want to make something clear. There's a difference between you intentionally designing a cultural or otherwise choice-driven flaw or contradiction, and having a world that logically doesn't make sense. In real life, there's a lot of backwards and contradictory things around the world, but that doesn't change the fact that we all breathe air, drink water, and are subjected to gravity. Make your societies imperfect, but make sure you know the difference between an intentional character flaw in the world and the world being broken. Part of designing larger groups of people to inhabit your world is having to figure out what kind of people would plausibly be there. Barren worlds might have smaller, nomadic groups. Overly abundant worlds might have wasteful spending and extravagant tastes. Some worlds have shrewd business people, others reflective artists, and still others unreflective simpletons. Your environment doesn't have to be real at all, but it does have to be plausible according to the world's own rules. Your protagonist's motives are going to be rooted in the culture around them. They either want to preserve it or destroy it, run from it or fix it. Her protagonist has to be from somewhere and they can accept it or reject it. There is one mechanical thing I'm going to give to you as advice. Design ideally two layers deeper than what you show, but at minimum one. Always make sure there are rules and mechanics in your world that keep everything from breaking continuity in the background. If you only design the things that are seen, your world is going to be riddled with paradoxes and other issues detrimental to both the world and the story. If you always have that extra invisible layer or two, you can keep everything safe. You know, things like a canonical way everyone with a certain job is trained, or that a certain custom is closely followed. Having these layers early helps position the things around them better. You don't have to show or explain these lower layers, but you absolutely need them to keep yourself from breaking your own world. Now that's probably the best time to also mention that world building has an iceberg effect. Not everything you make will be used, but designing the hidden parts is for your benefit, so I still recommend it. Presentation of a world is, in my opinion at least, the most difficult part of world building to grasp. You spend hours a day for weeks designing a world, and that level of knowledge might actually start to hinder your writing. I've said before to avoid letting your characters become lore lecturers, and this is when the temptation to do so is at its strongest. There's a building that you really want to fit the history you made for it in the dialogue. Or there's a historical background character that you really want to name drop. Take a deep breath. Remember, you're writing a story here. The world is an important component, but don't let it mess up your characters or plot. If you explain the lore behind anything in your world, the first question the reader or audience will ask is, I wonder how that is going to play into the rest of the story. If you don't have a solid answer for that, don't explain the lore. Things can be referenced if you keep them consistent, but just remember that the more focus is on a certain thing, the stronger the expectations are that the thing is directly related to the story at hand. I said earlier in this video that your readers or audience are investing their time into you. If you spend lots of that time describing things that don't matter to this plot, 
they'll immediately feel like you wasted that time and they won't invest anymore. The next thing is to keep as much of the world's basic workings out of dialogue. If you have an army that salutes by stomping your left foot, you don't need a character to say to another character, oh, we salute by stomping our left foot. Just let it happen in narration or the camera. Your readers and audience are smarter than you might think. They can figure out basic stuff like that without needing to beat it into their brains. It saves precious lines of dialogue for things that matter personally to the character. Which is a great segue to my next point. Building intricate fictional worlds is a lot of fun, and you will find great significance your world brings to you. It's beautiful, and most readers and audiences won't care. It's your job to make them care. Imagine you are sitting in a night class for history. You've been up for 16 hours, 8 of which were spent at your stressful job, written tens of pages worth of academic work right before class, and for the last 30 minutes, your professor has been lecturing ad nauseam about how terrible of an experience it was for the Romans at the Battle of Cannae. Question, do you really care about the Romans at Cannae? Or are you more focused on how terrible your own present experience is? Objectively, sure, you're not suffering as badly as a Roman getting hacked to death in a losing battle. But personal experience is powerful. Keep that in mind. When you are designing and then presenting your world, always remember that no matter how much effort you put into it, the only way people will be invested in the story is if you make it personal. The protagonist is how the reader or audience experience your world. Is your protagonist supposed to rise against an oppressive government? Don't lecture the protagonist on why they need to fight back. Instead, show that the government directly and explicitly oppressing someone that the protagonist cares deeply about. Inspiring the protagonist inspires the audience. Don't show your world as if you're teaching it to the reader. Show your world as if the reader is living in it. On a very related note, more effort should be spent on the little things, so to speak. The more the protagonist cares about something, the more effort should be put into its design and how it is implemented into the plot. If something is too distant to make personal, then don't spend more than a line or two about it, and even then, that's a lot for something that isn't personal. Now that you know the very basics, feel free to start getting serious about your world building. If you'd like to see videos about world building for specific genres, let me know in the comments section. The next video is going to be about writing in first person, third person, and even the ever rare second person points of view. I'll see you all there. Until then, keep writing.